Welcome to The Report Card, where we evaluate efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. Charter schools have long been controversial, but perhaps no charter school network has generated as much controversy as New York City's Success Academy. Founded in 2006 by Eva Moskowitz, these schools have made news year after year for their unprecedented success on standardized tests. But they've also drawn fire from critics who have forcefully criticized Moskowitz and aspects of the school culture. In today's podcast, I sit down with Robert Pendicio, Senior Fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, to discuss his new book, How the Other Half Learns, Equality, Excellence, and the Battle Over School Choice, which offers an inside look at the charter school network. As part of his writing process, Pondesio spent a year embedded in a success academy school in the South Bronx, observing what makes Moskowitz's model tick. His book not only offers a fascinating window into success, but it also raises vital political questions surrounding public education and school choice. Robert Pondesio, thanks for coming in. Welcome to AEI. Thanks, Ned. So, Robert, you're a senior fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation. And you've been an inner city school teacher. Still am, at least part-time. Still, still yeah, in, part-time. Yeah. Uh, but we brought you here to talk about your new book, How the Other Half Learns, Equality, Excellence, and the Battle Over School Choice. I've read the book. I'm probably going to read it again because I read it under time constraints, and I, and I want to go through it a little more slowly. But it says right here, it's, a, it's about your year inside America's most controversial charter school, mm -hmm. which is Success Academy Correct. in New York. So just to start off, what's made Success Academy one of the most notable and notorious charter school networks? Oh, goodness. How much time do we have? Uh, well, for starters, uh, Success is led by a very controversial lightning rod figure, the, the, its founder and CEO, Eva Moskowitz, who's a former New York City council person, uh, long rumored to be interested in running for mayor someday. The thing that makes them both an object of envy and scorn, I think, is their, is their results. Uh, there are, and this is just from memory, uh, so I hope I've got this more or less right. Um, last year, I think there were about 37, 38 Success Academy schools with kids in testing grades. The, the poorest performing one had something like 92% of the kids at or above grade level in math and a similar number, about 85% at or above grade level in, uh, in, in reading. Those were the worst ones. In other words, all the other ones were better. And, and so nobody, literally nobody, as far as I know, in this country has grown a charter network to that size, 17,000 kids, 50 schools roughly, without a, uh, an identifiable weak sister, as it were. So in terms of their quality and consistency, that's un literally unprecedented. So, so people have been curious, as have I, for a very long time, okay, how exactly do they do this? Because nobody else seems to have cracked this Sure, and to, and to put this in perspective, you know, the Holy Grail is closing the achievement gap, right? right? We want to right. close the achievement gap. Oh, they gap haven't closed it. They've, 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 they've uh, reversed it. They've reversed it. Right. If, if Success Academy were a standalone school district, and with 17,000 kids, it's larger than many school districts in New York State, it would be by far the, uh, the, the highest performing one in the state of New York including places like Scarsdale and Jericho sure. and Long Island that are, that are you know, yeah. with multi-million dollar homes and whatnot. Names, so. names we know. Yeah. Uh, um, so the book gets into these things, and uh, it, it's really uh, well done. It evokes uh, a year that you spent and your experiences observing mm -hmm. with not unfettered, but pretty wide pretty open close. access. Yeah. Uh, you spent most of your time in Bronx One. I, I usually don't do this, but you've got a, a, a great... Uh, prologue here, and um, it really sort of sets the tone. So I'm actually going to ask you to read it. Um, uh, sure. Yeah, just Happy to. Uh, take a go at it. It, it doesn't take too long. No, and it really kind of gives you a sense of the, 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 the flavor. So thanks for asking. Uh, it's as follows. The leadership team at Success Academy Bronx One Elementary School is making its morning round of classroom visits. Principal Elizabeth Van Lick started the day by announcing deliverables for every teacher, which she and her assistant principals expect to see when they enter a classroom. Students should be on task at least 95% of the time. Teachers are expected to notice off-task behavior 100% of the time and without prompting take corrective action to refocus and re-engage inattentive students every time. After each classroom visit, Van Lick and her team strategize in the hallway, rehearsing the feedback each teacher should get. One of the assistant principals goes back inside and whispers into the teacher's ear. Changes are made immediately, in real time, and without interrupting classroom instruction. After the walkthrough, the school leadership team huddles to discuss both teachers and students who need their immediate attention. The meeting concludes with a discussion of whole school improvements that need to be made for tomorrow. 
Two assistant principals take out their cell phones and start calling parents to ask for brief chats in person at that afternoon's dismissal to address concerns that have come up with their children. It's August 15th. The school year is three hours old. So that was literally the first day. Three hours old. <laughs> yeah, and that level of intensity. <laughs> that's a, that's right. a marked difference from what we expect to see in a typical you think? Uh, house. Yeah. Uh, in a typical school. When you started out this project, uh, you got permission to come into the school for yeah. the year. What did you expect to do? Well, I, I expected, I think I wrote this in the book, to, to, to tell a story about curriculum and instruction, or at least I expected that's what the story would be. And part of that is confirmation bias, frankly. I mean, that's what I tend to write about and focus on in my work is is practice, what kids do all day. In the classroom. In You're the classroom. That's exactly classroom, right, which I think right? we've just basically missed. Those of us who are in the reform space, we tend to focus on the structures, you know, testing, teacher quality, data, chartering, etc. I'm, I'm the weird guy who says, uh, can we talk about what the kids are doing all day? Right. So I wanted to tell a story about what the kids were doing all day, uh, but that ends up being largely a story about uh, school culture as much as more than curriculum and instruction. Yeah, and so let me put a pause on that because sure. I definitely want to get to the school culture part. Uh, it's fascinating, but at the same time, it, it's worth outlining what the curriculum instruction approach that mm -hmm. happens in success schools is, and also to note that it happens pretty uniformly across Very uniformly. success schools. So yeah. just lay it out for us briefly. Yeah, sure. I mean, on, on the one hand, why do you do a book like this? Because why do we have charter schools? We're hoping they're going to be laboratories of innovation, as it were, that are going to teach us lessons that we can apply more broadly. Sure. Uh, I don't believe, and we can talk more about this later, if you like, that there are all that many lessons. Eva Moskowitz would probably disagree. Uh, I know she disagrees. But one of the lessons I think that is transferable is is the curriculum. Now, let me start this by saying, look, I'm a curriculum guy. I you know, really do believe there's good, better, and best. I have very strong feelings about curriculum. I, I don't necessarily love some of the curricular choices that success makes. But the key thing, a bit of an epiphany for me, is that they have a curriculum. And, and, and it, even though it may not be what I would choose if I were starting a school, the fact of the matter is having a well-defined curriculum changes the teacher's job in ways that I think contribute to success's success, as it were. Well, hold on a second, sure. Robert, because every school's got a curriculum. You think so? I can, let me assure like you that so. you would like to think so. Most of us would. Uh, most of us are wrong. Yeah, at least at the elementary and middle school level, uh, you know, and brief diversion, there was a RAND study some years ago that showed uh, what a lot of us knew, but they actually put numbers to it. Something like 98%, almost literally every teacher in America is relying on materials, some or in, in whole or in part, materials they find themselves, create themselves or find themselves. So uh, the de facto curriculum in this country tends to be Google and Pinterest and teachers pay right. teachers and whatnot. So yes, uh, you, you're, you are under the impression that many of us are, but, but frankly, Nat, it's an incorrect impression. And, and, and at success, they have a well-defined curriculum. curriculum, and it, if, if I'm in one classroom in Bronx One, I'm going to see another classroom Almost across Almost certainly. Town. You walk across the hall, and you can probably hear the teacher you know, finishing the sentence you heard in the other one. Uh, uh, but that, that gives a misimpression. I don't want to give the impression that there's a scripted curriculum. It's right. not scripted. It is prescriptive, so to speak. So there's no mystery about what gets taught. But what this does is it changes the job of a teacher. Instead of spending all that time on Google and Pinterest, you're, you're practicing teaching that lesson. You're studying student work. You're building relationships with kids and families, all of which is more valuable than sitting there night after night with the empty plan book by your elbow thinking, what am I going to teach tomorrow? So that, that, that change of the culture of teaching from being a, a lesson designer and deliver to a pure pedagogue, if you like, I think that that's how they get uh, young, ambitious people to competence and beyond as teachers very quickly. Right. Now, success has sort of this reputation as they're a uh, drill and kill school, yeah, you know, really. on the basics. It makes you think non-progressive uh, education, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Well, it's interesting because um, Eva Moskowitz <clears throat> likes to describe her schools as, I think this is her quote, Catholic school on the outside, Bank Street on the inside. Uh, everybody knows what Catholic school is. Bank Street is this kind of you know progressive, uh, right. uh, Dewey-esque school, yeah. college of education uh, in on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I actually 
think it's a little bit less progressive than than Eva Moskowitz suggests. Right. Uh, there's not a lot there that would meet my test for progressive education. Their approach to math is is fairly constructivist. Uh, it's not drill and kill. That said, um, but it's a, it's a again a prescriptive curriculum. They do a lot of things that do make sense that sh- others should do. They they stress phonics in the early grades. They stress automaticity in math. Uh, but but let's be clear that 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 Catholic piece of the of, of the, the the model. It's very much in evidence. Uniforms, kids walking in straight line, you know, very high expectations, uh, uh, very rules driven. Um, you're going to show up at this time. You're going to go home at that time. Sure. They don't. They have. Uh, you know, they they are unabashed about suspending kids even as young as kindergarten if they break the rules. It's right. actually high expectations for parents. Well, well, this is where you get into the culture. Part, that's right. right. I went in to talk well, about that's the Catholic to, to look at uh, at curriculum mm-hmm. instruction, and I, a lot of the book is about the culture. Yeah. And uh, so, w- what stands out? How does how does the culture at six Success academies stand out from what we expect in other schools. Yeah, well, it's it's the fact that it's it's quite well codified. You know, it's it's interesting to me if you'll indulge a brief digression, how much I've learned since leaving the classroom. I was, uh, and by the way, the, the, it's worth noting, the reason I ended up in this school at Bronx One is it's literally across the street from where I was a student teacher in the New York City Department of Education and a few blocks from where I was a fifth grade teacher in a low performing public school for, for five years. So many things that I learned almost accidentally as a teacher that I intuited my way to, I see in evidence there. And I remember saying when I was a classroom teacher, you know what, I just want there to be one set of rules. They don't have to be my rules. But there can't be a different set of rules in my room, in Ms. Balraj's room, in Ms. Hall's room. Sure. The kids have to know how to conduct themselves in every place in here. We all have to be singing from the same hymnal. That was, at the time as a teacher, my frustration speaking. Well, that's what they do at Success. I mean, there is a very well understood, coherent, cohesive, common culture throughout all their schools. Uh, so, so it leaves no mystery for kids as to what's expected of them. So, Robert, let me ask you a question about uh, how this culture gets extended mm-hmm. across all these schools, right? I mean, in a lot of districts, you will have efforts to make things this, the same, but there's actually a good bit of autonomy and differentiation across schools, it seems like there's a lot of uniformity across these schools and also some staffing models at Success that enable them to do that. How does that work? Yeah, I, I, hiring is a big part of it as well. I mean, you don't you don't find yourself uh, teaching at Success Academy by accident. They kind of put you through the ringer on the front end and then train you. I, I wish, honestly, I'm not sure I could work at Success, but I sure wish I'd train there. Um, but they, you know, so so they can they can sort a little bit for your know, skill and will, as it were, and then and then. Uh, create teachers out of mostly young staff who really tend not to have, uh, you know, come with, with, with other preconceived notions in, right. in many, in many ways. They also have, uh, and this is, this is another piece, I think, Nat, that would be transferable to, to other settings. They've got a really good ops team, operations. Every school has what they call a bomb or business operations manager. Um, best title in the school. It's, no doubt. It is kind of cool. I'm, I'm the bomb. Um, and these are the folks who are responsible for everything non-instructional. You know, a window is uh, a light is out, a window shade is broken. There's there's you know, graffiti in the courtyard. Uh, they literally do walkthroughs uh, multiple times to create that. You know, and, and I'm not sure this is uh, so something we can we can brag about, but it's it's almost the broken windows sure, thing. Yeah. You know, it creates a culture, especially in a neighborhood where schools are often uh, covered with trash or graffiti. You know, that are unlovely places. These these schools become because of the operations team and because of this coherent culture, are bright, cheerful, well lit, inviting. Um, you know, they're 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 warm places to be in, despite the reputation uh, or that, that some people have with uh, or perceive uh, with success. Uh, but the, these uh, business or these these bombs, these operations people, that's their full time job. Basically, is making sure that everything is working so that and and all of it too is focusing the teacher's job on teaching right. uh, and, and the principal's job on being an instructional leader. Right. Everything so they else onboard is, a lot of the operations yeah. and this offloads a lot of responsibilities that teachers yeah, it just it focuses It focuses everybody else's job on the task at hand. Yeah, and you brought up Broken Windows uh, sort of approach. I thought of the same thing as I yeah. read in the book. Um, and it, it brings me back to the tough stands that even Moskowitz is really willing to take Sure. In, in this model and leaves me to the, the basic question. How important is Eva Moskowitz to Success Academy? I think huge. Uh, her, her, she, I'm not sure it could be overstated how important she is. In other words, it feels like, and, and it's interesting because she's not a major character in the book. Right. Um, I feel like plenty has been written about her, sure. uh, but it would be incorrect to suggest anything other than 
her ideas, her vision, her energy drives uh, the model. To so it, it's 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 really a manifestation of 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 who she is. I think in, in in many ways. So she'd be difficult to replace. That said, there are any number of of uh, principals and and network staff who have just drunk deeply from right. from uh, you know her her vision. So I think is it possible that they could maintain this level of of excellence without her? For a while, but it's almost inevitable in this work. Things, you know, we, we, you put a new person in charge, and they kind of want to tinker sure. with the model. Sure. Uh, what's it like to teach in a success academy? It's really hard. Um, there were so many times when I was in a classroom where I was in the presence of what I perceived to be really good instruction, and my very next thought would be, "I'm not sure I could do this." Um, what do you mean? Well, I, I, look, I, I guess particularly in math, I'm an unrepentant algorithm guy. I want kids to know their math facts, and and I'm not going to. Um, uh, I'm going to teach you the steps to long to, to, to long division rather than try to you know can have you conceptualize it. Um, that said, watching the way they teach math at uh, Success Academy cause still causes me to kind of question my convictions around there. So it's real. I, I shouldn't be glib about it. I ended up feeling hmm, maybe I sold my kids short by not thinking they're capable of learning math this way. Maybe I sold myself short as a teacher um, by by uh, leaning into my frustration after you know a few days of trying to get kids to do it the conceptual way, just closing the door and showing them the the, the steps. Maybe maybe I failed them and I sold them short. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a couple other episodes in the book that are. They're tough to read, at least with a dry <laughs> eye. Some of them. Yeah. They have some. Uh, Kindergarten teachers yeah. who put a lot on the kids. They talk, what do they uh, push it on the kids? Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's put the lift on the kids. Yeah. Uh, and they um, they make heavy demands. Yeah, and they are non repentant about it. And that seems like it would be a tough thing to get acclimated to. You know, I I, I think I describe uh, somewhere in the book that the entire thing's a bit of a Rorschach test, right? There was this one moment. Speaking of of, of kindergarten, uh, I spent. One, one classroom I kept returning to over and over was a classroom uh, led by a woman named Carolyn Saskowski, um, who just struck me as particularly gifted. Uh, and, and, and it was a good representation of what they're trying to, tr- trying to achieve. To me, one of the, the, the big moments in this book where I kind of start to understand it myself, there was what I call a come to Jesus meeting where she is um, – Functionally, reading the riot act to parents about how they need to step up their game and and be more supportive, and to and, parents of kindergartners, to parents of kindergartners, right. and you know you're talking about you know reading this without a dry eye. I was in the audience um, w- when she was doing this, and I was moved by by her passion and her commitment. And and I, I actually was rec- I think I still have it on my cell phone. I was recording it on my cell phone, and I still have it there now. So I went home and and started transcribing the uh, what what she was saying. And it just felt different. In other words, in the moment, I was moved by it. And when I started looking at just the words she said, I'm like, oh, my Lord, the stuff that came out of that girl's mouth. Yeah. It just seemed harsh and, and demanding and a little cold. And, and that's when this occurred to me that this is very much a Rorschach test. If you listen to the words or if, you, if, if, you, if you're in, in context, it can feel one way. It, it might feel a different way on the page. And that probably surfaces how you feel about charter schools and no excuses schools and the demands we make on parents. It's, it's going to say more about the reader, I think, than, 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 the, than, than the model. Well, it's interesting you say that. I, I read a couple of reviews, sort of, you know, looking for different perspectives on the book. And there are some folks who uh, are, you know, maybe uh, instinctive critics of sure. success who have drawn some lines out of the book, and man, do they look rough. I mean, they are some pretty tough words, yeah. but uh, it's, it's, a, it's much more compassionately communicated in, in, in the book, which is full of a lot of detail, a lot of you know, dialogue, activity in the classroom, out of the classroom with uh, parents, teachers, and students. And again, I, I think it's, a, it's an excellently written book and, and, and really that. worth a read and, and an easy read, um, if uh, occasionally tear jerking. Let's talk a little bit more about teachers because uh, success does burn through staff. Yeah, they really do. I mean, uh, I don't have data on this, but um, doing some reporting and anecdotally, it, you know, it, it seems like forty percent turnover in school is not uncommon, and some even higher than that. Uh, this is one of those things that I think work against it being a scalable model. It's probably a lot easier to get a steady crop of you know, bright, eager young men and women willing to to come for a year or two in a place like New York City than say, you know, young staff. Ohio or Utica, sure. for example. Yeah. Uh, privately, I don't think this made it into the book because I, I think this was what I've what I've learned since. Uh, 
they seem to be slightly less concerned about that than they than they have been. In other words, it's making their life difficult, obviously, sure. to have to replace all these 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 teachers every year. But so far, it's not hurting them. Well, you know, that's a little bit of a stunner, quite frankly. It really right? is. Right? And you know, if you were faced with replacing forty percent of your staff every year and maintaining the and same quality. instructional program, yeah, I I would be amazed if you could pull it off. And you'd have to pull it off with a Pretty centralized program. Well, I think that's right. I think that's right. So it, part of it is this kind of hiring that they do. Part of it is the model and the culture that um, it, it seems pretty easy to determine whether or not you're the person you're bringing in is is uh, down with the program, as it were, or not. Uh, but it, again, it's, it's not necessarily scalable. And I don't want to uh, d- diminish. Uh, it's 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 another Rorschach test. On the one hand. It says something interesting that you can get fairly inexperienced young men and women to this level of competence fairly quickly with a well codified program. Right. That uh, flies in the face of a lot of notions that we have about teacher quality and 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 experience and the value of that. On the other hand, it's not sustainable either. Uh, you know, this is this is not something a place by and large where you're going to make a career out of. You know, uh, if you want to. You know, be be married, have children, go home, and take your kids to soccer in the afternoon. You're probably not going to uh, be a success academy teacher. Yeah, it's you know, it really makes the the reader and folks who are focused on you know education policy question the value of the unit of analysis yeah. when it comes to teacher quality. Because what we've got here is something where it cannot be the 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 quality of the teachers coming in they're all very young yeah. vast majorities of them you talked about one veteran teacher 27 years old exactly. veteran teacher right, right. a rare that's right. and that's astonishing and if it's not the individual unit of analysis then the system is working uh, powerfully to standardize these things. And that struck me through. The, through yeah, the I think book. that's right. But I also think back to the idea of, of codifying the teacher's job in a way that is scalable. This, this I think, is a powerful lesson. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not a teacher basher, okay? Right. Um, but I do think that we have made the job far too hard for myriad reasons we, we can talk about. Uh, so this is a model that, even if it is intense, there are lessons here that we can learn, yep. and the fact that you can get this level of results. I mean, one another fascinating piece of this. Um, I'm old enough to remember some of the original KIPP schools, for example, where then as now you would walk down the hall and you would see schools named after you know where the teacher went sure. in, went to school, right. and promoting a college yeah, expectation. Well, that's exactly right to, to to create the college going culture. So you know back in the day when we were all talking about uh, increasing the, the 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 quality of teachers, you would see those you know KIPP and achievement first classrooms named like Harvard and Yale and Stanford right, right. and whatnot. Um, there are some of those at Success Academy, but, but by and large, they are, um, they're, they're much more mundane, so to speak. There's Hunter College or SUNY Oneonta, where I went to school, uh, Ford and Iona. There was a kindergarten class at Bronx One called BMCC, which is Borough of Manhattan Community College. Huh. So, you know, however they're getting these results, it is, it is not that 20 year old paradigm of getting, you know, bright, shiny Ivy Leaguers to come in. And sure. they're, they're still committing a short amount of time, but they're not necessarily coming out of those elite schools. Um. I found it a little funny, but also illuminating the title of this piece that you wrote, uh, <laughs> yeah. introducing the book, uh, and I'll read it. The title was, I just wrote a book about Success Academy charter schools. It does not support your preferred narrative. I hope you hate it. Yeah. First Great of all, in marketing. <laughs> get a different uh, marketing advisor. That's the first thing. <laughs> Second of all, uh, what do you mean? I hope you hate it. Well, I, I, I mean, I meant it puckishly but earnestly. Right. In other words, uh, the intent of, of that piece, the intent of this book, really, is to kind of question people's priors. Look, you know, I, my ed reform credentials are in good order. I'm, I'm a choice guy. I'm a charter guy. I teach part time right now at a charter school, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, drinking too deeply of the ideology, so right. to speak, uh, or the political narratives. I guess more more accurately sure. uh, that that we have thrown about uh, in in reform and charter world for you know the last twenty years. You know, there are these dueling narratives. Um, you know, at the risk of oversimplifying, you know, the the the, the pro charter narrative goes. Um, 
you know, kid goes in this door, they get a good outcome. They go in that door, bad outcome. The only difference is, is, is the school. Um, if you are anti-charters, well, then it's, you know, you got to fix, uh, you know, um, poverty, racism, et cetera, fix those things and schools will be better. Well, you know, th there's a, there's a, you know, a lot of daylight in between those two. Um, but for various political reasons, we, we tend to be loyal to one of those narratives or, or, or the other. Neither one, I think, ha has served us very, very well. So when I say, here's my new book, I hope you'll hate it, it's interesting. Um, we talked in the first segment about this, this, this book and these schools being something of a Rorschach test. So you know, it, that's kind of what I expected, that regardless of where you are, pro-charter or anti-charter, pro-reform, anti-reform, you will see things in this book that will confirm your priors. My hope was that you would also see things that would, would challenge those priors. Sure. Um, I should probably write another piece at this point because so, uh, the book has been well received, which I'm pleased by, but, but it's not necessarily a good thing because that means you're only looking at the things that you want. I should probably probably write another book that says you like my book and, and I'm disappointed. Yeah. Well, let's let's bring up some of these different perspectives right. on this, and I'll reserve the right to advocate for the devil if it okay, helps, please uh, uh, to to make the conversation. One one of the things that often gets lobbed at Success Academy is. Uh, yeah, it does great because it's uh, it's creaming. Yeah. It's creaming. It's taking the best kids, and if we could take the best kids, sure, we'd have those scores too. Um, you say that that's not quite right. It's not, and quite that it's wrong. not quite wrong. Yeah. So what is what is the Stephen, this out what me. is the Stephen Colbert phrase? It's truthy. So <laughs> I guess it's right. truthy. Um, I think I'd end up describing this, and I think this is an accurate way to describe what success does. It's, it's a bit of a self selection engine. So. There is, there is creaming going on, um, but it's the parents who are self-selecting. Uh, it, it's worth discussing just briefly the way this works. I mean, there, there is this impression, and this is another part of the standard charter narrative, Absolutely. that because there is a, um, the existence of a lottery for oversubscribed charter schools, that therefore, by definition, you're getting a, um, a random assortment of, of, of kids. And that's true enough. Um, but what happens at success, and this has been hiding in plain sight for, for years, uh, they, you, win a, you win a seat in the lottery, then you're invited to a welcome meeting. Right. And even if you're on uh, the, the, the waiting list, what they call the likely list, remember that term, it's significant, if you're on the likely list, you still have to come to the meeting. Uh, at which point the, the, the school lays out in, in unsparing terms their expectations and their culture, and they ask you repeatedly, you have to ask yourself, mom and dad, is Success Academy right for you? Right. Not is it right for your kid, is it right for you? That's not an accident. Um, because a lot of parents decide, well, it's not right for me. I, this, this culture is too much. The expectations are too much. And, and then there's structural things as well. If you can't uh, bring your kid to school at 7.30 in the morning, pick them up 3.45 in the afternoon, half days on Wednesday, half days on Wednesday no transportation, it, yeah. no after school, then it's literally not for you. Right. Um, in other, it, it, whether it's uh, uh, by, by design or by happenstance, it, it favors families that have uh, parental bandwidth, if you like. Yep. Uh, so so the, while I don't have data on this, this is, I want to be clear on this, I'm not a researcher, this, my approach here is journalistic. Sure. But observably, you see families at Success Academy who tend to be married, religious, engaged, um, uh, motivated. Right. And, and to be quite frank, when teachers are looking for parents to support the instruction that's going on in their classroom... Yeah. These are the parents they want. Right? Well, that's exactly right. But I don't want to leave the impression that this is every parent. Sure. I mean, you're still talking about families living in poverty in places like the South Bronx. So nobody should kid themselves and say this is this is easy. It should be established that success as students are genuinely disadvantaged. Low they income, low income, almost exclusively low income families of color. Right. Yes. But they are not necessarily uh, the same as the families that I was teaching at, at PS 277 a few blocks away right. uh, some some years ago. I, I, I'm trying not to parse this to make, make too much of this, but I think when we look at the differences um, demographically, we're missing something. To, to use a term from marketing, you almost have to look at it psychographically. You know, the, the, the family that is uh, I would argue that the family that uh, raises their hand and says, oh, I want a charter school is immediately different than the family that does not say that. And then the family that says, no, I want Success Academy Charter School uh, is different than the other two. Yeah. And there's there are just a lot a, a, a lot of hoops that they have to press through. So right. my question but on that, this. That drives the culture. In yes. other words, you can't do these things. You can't have this just so culture, these high expectations, unless you have maybe not every family, but a critical mass of family voting with their feet repeatedly who become functionally the culture keepers. Right. So, you know, 
my question then, and you said you're not a researcher, you don't have the numbers on this, and I don't want numbers, I want a gut sense. Yeah. How potent is this mechanism whereby some parents leave because they're, they're not going to toe the line. It, yeah. It's too much. And it is too much, right? Black socks are not okay. <laughs> Only blue socks are okay. Right. They'll turn kids away at the door, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you don't come to the orientation meeting, we give your seat to someone else, right? These are, these are pretty potent yeah. roadblocks for some parents. Uh, so I'm just wondering, how far does it go? Well, I'm not sure. We'll say more. When you say how far well, I mean, does it go? How potent is this as a tool for creating a... Uh, a cadre of parents that is distinct yeah. from your run-of-the-mill cross-section of yeah. parents. Look, I think Eva Moskowitz might give you a different answer. Um, you know, uh, and I think for what for what it's worth, I, I think that they don't like the impression. And I want to be clear: I'm not trying to create the impression right. that this is the secret sauce. This is the starting line. Um, but it's look, it's just a lot easier. I don't, not easy, easier, Nat. Right. To accomplish these things with with families and students who are buying what you're selling, uh, as opposed to a coercive relationship where you're trying to get them in the game, which is sometimes how I felt as a as a teacher in the DOE. I was trying to you know get get my kids to 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 you know to to follow through and and step up. There, that's 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 a given, right. so to speak. And and if it's not a given, then you then you're pushing it back to the parents, and the parents make sure that you know the the, the kids are engaged and ready and whatnot. Sure. Um, so it's you know. I, I want to be try to be precise here. That's not the secret sauce, uh, but it's it it enables this culture of high achievement and these results, and I think it contributes to the consistency. And look, this is this is anybody who's watching this who you know my parents' generation who maybe went to Catholic schools in New York of the forties or fifties say, well, duh, that's right. that's the way this works. Yeah, you know. So it's this is this is why I kept focusing on school culture. Because it's interesting, right? In other words, this is the one thing in the reform era that we're almost not allowed to touch. Why do we have these random lotteries? Well, because we're supposed to do this with every child. So, uh, you know, can you do this with every child, or does it require families at some level who are who are buying what you're selling? Yeah, I think that that's a big lesson there, of, of, of these schools. In the book, you have the uh, the the is it come to Jesus yeah. chapter. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, and there's a there's a description of. Uh, a teacher going after kindergarten parents, it's making so, it clear yeah. that they are not doing their part of the bargain and that they need to step up. Yeah. That is the absolute message. And she's in it with them. So talk to me a little bit about this concept that's in the book a couple of times about this partnership or this marriage between the families that are there and the school staff. Yeah, look, this this is where um, I think Moskowitz has been done considerable dirt by by um, uh, media coverage and whatnot. There, there's this impression out there that one, they're claiming uh, students and parents, and, and as I just was describing, I think there, there there's self selection there, and there's this impression that these are harsh militaristic places, almost like Chinese cram schools in a way. Um, to be perfectly honest, there's a lot of things that they do that, as a as a teacher, as as an educator, I, I don't particularly love. I'm not crazy about sure. aggressive test prep. Um, while I, you know, a, a assistant principal once described me as an authoritarian teacher and did not mean it as a compliment. You know, you could argue that they take the behaviorism a little bit too far. What you can cannot miss uh, unless you want to miss it frankly is the deep investment that the the, the, the teachers have um, so you don't have to necessarily love their educational program um, but if you don't see the, the 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 deep engagement and ambition that the teachers have for their students well then then you're either hard-hearted or you don't want to see it a and that's part of the culture too um, I describe this in in one chapter where I, you know explaining it to myself I call it the gas factor which uh, if I can say is an acronym and the gas stands for Give a shit, yeah. um, you know. And if you think about that, this is this is what I think makes these schools most valuable. Even though they may do some things that you know you, you might not like, think of how rare this is to be in a community like the South Bronx, any you know inner city community in in, in a large urban city. If you are a, a low income kid of color, what reason do you have to expect your your relationship with the school or your parents' relationship with the school to be anything other than dismissive or, or you know or, or coercive? That's where you go to find out how little is expected of you. Right. By contrast, at Success Academy, nobody's telling you that this is easy. Um, 
you know, meaning uh, the, the standardized tests that they, they, they valorize so much. They're telling you it's hard, but they prepare you with attack strategies and, and, and practice tests and whatnot. And they are, you know, during test season, you're getting calls home from, from your teacher every night, you know, to, to review the test with your parents and whatnot. Right. And, and you're told, hey, kid, you're going to get a three, you're going to get a four, meaning, you know, on or above grade level. And then you go out and you get that three or your four. But that's not even the most significant part. All your friends do as well. All their friends do. Right. Every adult in your life is in on this. Right. The water and, you're swimming in. And you go home thinking, hey, I'm good at this. Right. I'm good at school. So in a way, to me, that even transcends. Uh, that, that, uh, I think that culture is more remarkable than even those remarkable test scores. Yeah. Just who else does this? This is the, the ultimately the most important value, I think, that emerges from this is you're raising a generation of kids who are just having a fundamentally different relationship with a place called a school. Yeah, the the whole discussion around the selection mechanism at work, and I'm yeah. trying to put that in antiseptic terms, there is a selection yeah. mechanism, however it works, um, is just a non-starter for a lot of folks because they say, sure. no, the purpose of the school is to raise all boats perfectly and we're going we're gonna to do it for every kid. And what you're saying sounds like something that is mutually exclusive. With that contention, can we make a system that um, can deliver high results for everybody when we may not have the buy-in that we need at home? And I, I, I wonder if this is yeah. uh, uh, well, this is know, part a challenge of the, to that. This belief. is this is part of the reason why uh, the, the, I think the book is a bit of a Rorschach test, and I'm trying to challenge people's priors here. Look, that's a lovely aspiration. We we should never give up on the idea that we can create a system of schools, an ecosystem of schools. Uh, that challenges and raises the performance of of, of every child or, or sure. darn near every child. That is that is a that is the right goal. Um, but one of the reasons uh, that the, the, this book is called "How the Other Half Learns." Is because I, I don't think I'm wrong about this, Ned. I, I feel like functionally we have set excellence and equity at war with each other uh, in in our schools and in this country. If you are a well off white guy like myself. Um, Nobody asked a question about when, when I decided to, to, to take my daughter out of the public school system, she didn't spend a day in public schools. If, if someone like me chooses a private school, chooses to move to the, bu the, the suburbs where your, your property taxes sure. or your de facto uh, school tuition, that's not only unremarkable, it's uncontroversial. You know, nobody questions my ability to do this. Now along comes an Eva Moskowitz and figures out a way to give low-income people of color something similar, and now it's a problem. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So, so what does that say? Um, I get to pursue excellence, but but if you are low income, black or brown, well, you get equity, and you get hand wringing, and you get excuses. So those aspirations are lovely, but but if you're, I don't think it's persuasive to a parent today to say we're working on it, or at least there's there's got to be a statute of limitations when you can no longer say, give us time, we're working on. Sure, when you come at this from a system level, it's uh, it's affected by this thing you call in here the parent lottery, yeah. right? You can win the lottery for the school, but to actually make that stick, you might need the parent lottery. You might need parents that are willing to to pull you through. Now, okay, but can I interject you here? You can. Because this is another unlovely thing that we do in this work. So I, I encountered these attitudes so often in the reporting of this book. So I described earlier um, the winners of that parent lottery and how this system, through you know, uh, design or happenstance, tends to favor parents disproportionately who are married, engaged, etc. Well, when you describe those families to people in our work, you know, you, you hear, well, I'm not worried about them. They'll be fine. Well, who says that to me? Who says that to you? You know, why do we think it's okay to say that or make those assumptions about low-income people of color? That if you've won the parent lottery, that's all you need. Because that's not all that, the, that, that my kid needs. It's not all that, that, that other people's kids need. And it's not all they're afforded. Well, that's exactly right. right. So there's this kind of, there, there, there's you know, two sets of kind of assumptions we make about inner city. And I speak as, as, as somebody who's been a teacher and a policy person. Um, they're, they're both rather um, unlovely. One is this attitude I just described where, oh, if you, if you have, um, you know, a, a, um, a, a, a functional family, you're, you're growing up in a two-parent household, parents employed, you'll be fine. Um, the other one is, is even more pernicious and worse, which is coming into a, an urban community saying, and seeing nothing but dysfunction. Oh, I can't make demands of parents. I can't engage them because right. um, everything's broken, dysfunctional, et cetera. You're, all these children are traumatized. Right. 
say what you will about Eva Moskowitz, you cannot accuse her of having low expectations of parents. That's right. There's a certain minimum level of respect that she has that is not that is structural the board. That, and, yeah. and, and, and frankly laudable. Now, uh, the flip side of this is, OK, when I'm thinking from a system perspective, yeah. what does Success Academy do to the degree that it siphons off these Kids who are parent lottery winners yeah. from the schools because well, part of another the, part, it is complicated because part of the assertion is that success is able to operate at this high level in part because they have that support at home. And if we are siphoning off that support, doesn't that make some schools jobs harder? Yes, it does. Did I just commit heresy? I was expecting a more complicated answer than <laughs> well, yes, well, no, it does. but this is this gets back to why I, you know, uh, questioning people's priors and why I wrote that kind of puckish piece about here's my new book. I sure. hope you hate it because that's the thing we're not supposed to say. And frankly, it's the thing that most of us in this work on the reform side probably don't believe. Uh, you know, we 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 have this idea that uh, you know we, we can create the rising tide that lifts all boats, and I'm not dismissive of that. I mean, I, certainly competitive factors. Sure make some sense. Um, but when I put on my you know, former teacher hat, when I think about uh, there were no success academies or even charter schools in the South Bronx when I was teaching there 10 or 15 years ago. But if I think about the families and the kids in my former classes who would be most likely uh, to be drawn off to a, a charter school, to a success academy, and now I imagine my classes without those kids there, uh, and now you're going to tell me, oh, no, I just made your job easier. Right. Well, that can't be right. Sure. If, if, if that's what research is telling us at the risk of offending uh, you know, my, my PhD research colleague here, uh, well, then we're asking the wrong questions. Yeah. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't account for culture. It doesn't account for motivation. Uh, maybe, you can, maybe there's some competitive effects there at work, but it's, it, it's, I think we have to be honest about that. I, you and, know, it rings true. I, my years of teaching. I had some kids that, you know, there's a spectrum of family involvement. Yeah. And I really appreciated those kids' presence you in my classroom. You sure do. <laughs> and now imagine that those kids go from being the culture outliers to the culture keepers. Yeah. Again, that's not to say that it's going to be easy right. in one place and hard, but it's easier. You can get more done. Look, at the end of the day, that's that to me is the real lesson of Success Academy. It shows you the upward or the upper limits of what can be achieved when every adult in a child's life is is singing from the same hymnal, so to speak, pulling on, on, on the oars. Parents Parents, teachers, administrators, etc. Let's let's talk about one last thing about sure. that hymnal. A lot of the notes in it are dictated from standardized tests. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. This place oh. is driven by standardized tests, and they ring the bell. Yeah, I mean, they ring the bell. There's no doubt about it. They do it consistently, and and sort of your other work and writing, yeah. you've been a little critical about uh, test-driven accountability and the effects that yeah. it can have on schools, on the narrowing of the curriculum. Um, two-part question. How does the test driver manifest mm -hmm. itself in Success Academy's uh, culture and operations yeah. and handicap when it's a good thing and when it's not? Yeah, boy, we could we could talk for an hour on just that question. I mean, I, I you know, I always say this. I've got a very complicated relationship with standardized testing. Nobody should sentimentalize the days before we had testing. Um, and in the main, the accountability impulse is a good thing. That said, I refuse to be uh, blind to the deleterious aspects of this, uh, the, the queering effect it has on school culture, uh, and, and some specific granular damages that it does in reading uh, comprehension instruction, yep. for example, curriculum narrowing, sure. for example, where the, the child's entire schooling becomes about reading and math and, and nothing else. Yep. I think those are real measurable effects. Um, well, that's, funny, that, those are the very topics that I'm curious yeah. about. <clears throat> How much of that evidence do you see? In other words, well, is success predicated on that narrowing, sure. or is it is it more well, than that? Okay, no. Uh, let, let me let me walk that back. They, they they are not narrowing the curriculum. It's interesting because at the end of the day, um, I, I think I even asked myself this in the book. I, I started worrying that I was falling victim to to Success Academy Stockholm syndrome by by dint of the fact that I was there so much because they do you know a lot of things that I don't necessarily like, but I, I liked what I was seeing in in the main and and as a whole. Um, and part of it is the culture; it's the motivation. 
testing as a defining principle. It, it focuses their, their, their efforts and, and it creates this metric of success that I think is more valuable than just the test score. This idea that I'm, I'm, I'm good at school and so are all my friends. Um, but it is, what, what is unknown and unknowable is the long-term effects on this. I mean, there's a, as I'm sure you know, a battle raging in our world about, uh, whether testing, uh, and, and a good, good outcome on a sixth grade ELA test predicts long-term life success attainment, et cetera. Um, I think the jury is very much out on that. Uh, I'm persuaded, I've persuaded myself that getting the child's relationship and a functional and successful relationship with school is, is important. Um, one of the other hats that I wear is in, in civic education, and I tend to view schools as civic, uh, civic institutions first and foremost. And to me, having a child having a productive relationship with the school as the civic institution of first resort, I think is important. And I don't want to di diminish that. That's not the same thing as because I'm getting a level four in my ELA and math test, I'm definitely going to college. I'm definitely going to be upwardly mobile. It'll be a long time before we, 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 we know that. But your larger point is exactly right. Uh, it would be dishonest to say that these schools are not very, very focused on, on test prep and those metrics. But let's also be honest, this is a condition we've imposed not on just Success Academy, but on schools at large. Sure. So it's, it seems unusual um, to blame an Eva Moskowitz or someone like that right. to be really good uh, or blame them for being really good at playing this game that we've demanded that they play. That's right. An institution shaped by its competitive environment succeeds and then we fault it for it. That may not be a fair uh, progression. <laughs> yeah. uh, for, for what it's worth, I think she's actually, she didn't need uh, outsiders to persuade her of the efficacy of standardized testing. I think she's very much a, a true believer. But I, I, I've also been around her and her, around her schools enough to know that whatever the metric would be that we would design, she would figure out a way to, to, to crush it. So uh, last question, uh, short one. The the book is, uh, it, it's, it, it's solid and it's reporting. It is just a Thank solid you. piece of reporting Appreciate that is that. interesting. It is not, it's just got a, a, a wide range of experiences, uh, emotions to share about it, uh, that, that you share in it. Um, but the test scores, let's move away from the test scores sure. and just writ large, when you come to a school and evaluate, especially having spent this much time in it. Mm -hmm. Is this a good school or not? Yeah, From it a, is. For, you know, that's my real question, right? Like, forget the test scores. It, you know, if they're scoring yeah. well on test scores, that that is a, a narrow indicator. But are Success Academies good schools? Yeah, it's, it, it, it is the only question that matters, right? And, and it's interesting because I get asked this question a lot. And usually in the context of it being a gotcha question, you know, people who don't like these schools think that they're challenging me by saying, well, Pandesia, would you send your child to Success Academy? And my honest and earnest answer reply is, well, what's, what are my choices? And this gets to the heart of why you write a book like this. So, you know, would I choose Bronx One over my daughter's Upper East Side Manhattan school? No, I would not. And neither would you. Uh, would I choose it over the public school a few blocks away where I work for five years? Yes, I would. And so would you. If I were a parent, uh, in New York City and I had a choice between uh, any charter school, would Success Academy be the, the first one I, I chose? Yeah, probably. I, I, I think so. And I, I say that even though I work in a competing charter school. Sure. I, you know, I, I still think it's, it's a culture, but that's my choice. Um, I kind of like rules and, and, and whatnot. That's, that's my orientation as a parent. That's sure. my orientation as a teacher. Um, does that make it right for every parent? No, it, it, it doesn't. Um, and and I, I, if nothing else, I hope we can get past this idea that there is a right way, that there is a true and only way to educate not just our own children, but especially other people's children. Sure. Yeah. Different people see different things and they make uh, different conclusions. It's sort of like a Rorschach test, right? Hmm. Sounds like a good idea for a book. <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming by to talk about it and Thanks, uh, I appreciate the work, Robert. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to The Report Card with Nat Malkus. And special thanks to our guest, Robert Pendicio. Thanks also to the producers that make this show happen. That includes Nathan May, Tyler Hoover, and Gage Hurley at Liquid Media. Remember, you can subscribe to The Report Card on iTunes, Google, or your favorite podcast player. And while you're there, leave us a comment and a review. It helps other people find the show. We look forward to your comments, questions, and topic suggestions. Send us an email at ed.podcasts at aei.org. That's all for this episode. I'm Nat Malkus.